Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Ashley Griffin, a Broadway performer, writer, and theater journalist. If you're new here, welcome. Don't forget to click the subscribe button for more from your theatrical Hermione Granger. So let's jump in. A few weeks ago, the Times Union published an article titled, Why Williamstown Theater Fest has no full shows this summer. There are several reasons given, but the one that has drawn the most attention is the issue of addressing long-standing but recently reaching boiling point level concerns about the treatment of staff and company members. The article says, the entire sound crew for Row, a 2021 musical put on by the festival, walked out of a July rehearsal, citing a punishing schedule and unsafe working conditions outdoors during thunderstorms. Investigative reporting by the Los Angeles Times later revealed trouble began before the season started. In February 2021, 75 festival alumni signed an eight-page letter to the festival board alleging dangerous working conditions, abusive conduct, and exploitation of apprentices and interns who were unpaid and in some cases were charged tuition for their training, the LA Times reported. It said its interviews with 25 alumni revealed not a professional springboard, but a development program that exposes artists in training to repeated safety hazards and a toxic work culture under the guise of prestige. The article goes on to say that, the operational model for the Williamstown Theater Festival for decades was to offer audiences big budget productions with big name casts and sumptuous sets and costumes made possible by huge crews of low or unpaid trainees. The company at full strength numbered more than 300 with as many as 180 as interns or apprentices. The rallying cry in response to this article, as well as with other instances of festivals or companies relying on unpaid internships to get their shows up, has been along the lines of, start paying everyone who works for you a living wage. I 100% agree. Every single person in every single industry, no matter their job, deserves to earn a living wage. But the problem at the heart of these kinds of stories is much more insidious and complex. It would be easy if this was simply a case of some folks at the top being greedy and trying to get unpaid labor. And while I'm sure that is the case in some instances, it's far from the actual story going on within the machinery of the economics of theater in the United States that is making this a problem at large. I don't know the ins and outs of the Williamstown situation, and this video is not meant to comment on it specifically. I'm merely using it as a springboard to start a larger conversation. I know both performers and good, very well-meaning producers who have been devastated by the current state of things. And few are talking about the deeper economic issues that are rotting the future of the theater industry from the inside out. For anyone new to the conversation surrounding the economics of theater, let me give a very basic breakdown. There are two kinds of producers who work on any given project, a lead producer and a financial producer. The lead producer is the person running the show, as it were. They sign an option agreement with the writers or secure the rights to a show, they help you put the team together, the director, designers, etc., and put a plan in motion to get a given project to the stage. If this is a new work, that often includes putting up developmental readings where they invite backers who might want to get in on the project. They continue this process until they've raised enough money to put on the show, sometimes putting in money themselves as well. Financial producers are just what the term implies, folks who put a significant amount of money into the show. They're not making artistic decisions, but they're financially supporting a project with the goal of earning a profit. Festivals and theater companies can also function as lead producers, and that specific title would most closely line up with whoever the artistic director of a company is. They too are trying to raise money for a given project, but they go about it in a slightly different way. Many festivals and companies apply for grants and receive investments from interested parties or their subscriber base. If they are a nonprofit, they are also allowed to collect tax deductible donations though they cannot turn a profit from an artistic venture. But the main idea behind all of this is that whoever is putting up a show 
needs to have a financial plan that will allow them to make a profit, or in the case of a nonprofit, earn their expenses back. And this is where the economics have gotten worse and worse over the past decades, and especially in the past few years. One of the reasons the golden age of Broadway was a golden age is because the economics allowed for it to happen. Back in the day, it was more cost effective to run more shows each season for less time. So for example, it would make more financial sense to have multiple shows go into the same theater in a year different offerings would bring in the same crowd multiple times. It allowed producers to take chances on new writers or unusual pieces. They needed more projects to fill slots, and if one wasn't a hit, the financial repercussions weren't dire. Then came along the one-two punch in the 90s, 2000s, with the advent of McMusicals, which were so expensive to put on, they had to run for years or even decades to make a profit, and the response to scalped tickets, where the producers simply upped their ticket prices to match what the scalpers were asking for, figuring if the scalpers could get that much for a ticket, the producers should be getting it too. It's easy to chalk all our economic woes up to these elements, but it really only explains what's happening at the largest level. And it does nothing to explain why other countries, who are also creating musical level offerings, are not in the same situation as the U.S. Inflation has a lot to do with it. Greed has something to do with it, though in this instance I'm not talking about from producers. And good old capitalism has its effect too. Let's break it down. Let's say I'm a lead producer. I have a great new play by a wonderful new playwright and I'm excited to get it up. Here's how it works when I go to talk to potential investors. I present them with what's known as an investor's packet. This basically explains what the budget is, how much money needs to be raised, and how many points a certain amount of investment capital is worth. That means if you put in X dollars, what percentage of royalties do you get? Remember, you can't have more than 100% of royalties, so every percentage point is very valuable. And as the producer, I don't even have 100 royalty points or percentages to offer my investors. The writers automatically get a certain number of points, as often does the director, choreographer, and depending on your contract, the cast, and I get some as the lead producer. Keep in mind, that's really the main way some of your team members are getting paid. If I'm directing a Broadway show, I will get a stipend meant to get me through all of pre-production, out of town, rehearsals, and opening. But when you really divide it up in terms of what I'm making per hour over a very long period of time, it's not as much as you think. No, I'm hoping that the show is successful so I can actually make money when my royalty checks start coming in. And those don't start showing up until the initial expenses on a show have been recouped. So for every royalty point already accounted for, that's less value an investor gets for any money they put into a show. The pot is now no longer 100%. It's, let's say, 90%. So even if I single-handedly finance the entire show, I'm only getting 90% of the royalties. And it may take years to get any royalties at all, since, at first, I'm just waiting to recoup my initial investment. The budget is also broken down into how much money do we need to get the show up, i.e. for rehearsals, further development, to get the show into the theater and keep it running for a few weeks. And what are the weekly operating costs? How much does the show cost per week to stay open? This includes the weekly fee for theater rental, salary for all relevant parties, costume maintenance, etc. Ideally, your weekly operating cost will be covered by your weekly box office, so the show will become self-sustaining. Basically, all this comes down to a simple formula. Number of seats in the theater times ticket price minus weekly operating cost equals profit amount. The number of seats in a theater is rarely negotiable, though it is in some spaces. Ticket cost is usually pretty consistent within a certain range. The only thing you can really actively mess with, at least when a show's first going up, is your weekly operating costs. This is one of the reasons so many Broadway shows have been pared down, as discussed by the recent New York Post article, Broadway shows are becoming embarrassingly cheap looking. Note how many of the shows that go against this trend originated in the UK. More on this in a bit. Well, you may think, 
Doing this show on Broadway would be great, but that's going to cost a lot of money. Let's look at doing this great new show in a smaller venue where our costs won't be so high. And that's where the ratio of operating costs to max ticketing capacity actually starts to get way worse. In fact, right now, it's basically impossible to make a profit off of an off-Broadway or off-off-Broadway show. It's actually way more financially sound to do a show on Broadway than off-off-Broadway. Here's an example. One of the most popular actors' equity agreements for young artists or new work in development is the Showcase Code, which, keep in mind, is only able to be used in New York City. As of the making of this video, it basically says that you can pay your performers a stipend of whatever you and the performers agree to, but you are limited to 12 performances total over a max of four consecutive weeks and must be in a theater under 99 seats. Producers must have an annual gross income of less than $200,000 and the budget cannot exceed $35,000, exclusive of union actor members' stipends. Each cast member gets two free tickets, industry professionals, as specified by AEA, must be comped, and all AEA members must be offered comp tickets on a standby basis. There are other requirements as well. Right now, a very good weekly rate for a reputable off-off-Broadway space with around 73 seats is about $2,500. A normal performance week is eight shows a week. So for 12 performances, you'll need the theater for two weeks. But wait a minute, don't forget, you need to tech in the space. So you're either going to have to lose a couple performance days or rent the theater for a few extra days. The same space runs $1,500 for a single day. Yeah that weekly rate is looking pretty good. Or you can rent it for an extra week. I'm using the rental numbers for Theater for the New City as a reference. So let's say you rent out the theater for three weeks. That's $6,500. You're off off Broadway, so you don't really want to go over around $20 or so a ticket. A few things to keep in mind. People will often wait to come see a show later in its run, and word of mouth means that people will usually hear about your show later rather than sooner. That means that often for off-off-Broadway shows, the first few performances have the lightest attendance. You want your show to stretch over the most time possible, but you legally only have max four weeks to spread them out, and every week you add is an additional cost. Most of the people who will be coming to see your show are industry members and Actors' Equity members, so a lot of your tickets will end up having to be comped. But let's take a really good scenario. Let's say on average at every performance out of your 73 available seats, 15 are comped and 10 are empty. You sell out the rest of the house at the max price of $20 per ticket. You do 12 performances. That means that the most amount of money you can possibly make is $11,520. Well, 6,500 is automatically gone for the theater rental, so you're down to $5,020. But that's not really your profit. You have to rehearse. Let's say you have a short rehearsal period. Two weeks, five hours a day, five days a week. A very inexpensive rehearsal studio that will give a manageable amount of space is around $35 an hour. That means you're spending $1,750 on rehearsal space. You now have $3,270 to cover pay for your actors, designers, and creative team members, build a set, buy costumes, market your show, etc. Let's say you have seven actors, four designers, a casting director, a director, stage manager, and a board op. Let's say you pay each of them a non-living wage stipend of $100 per week. That's the rest of your budget gone. Forget about anything else, including a set, costumes, and marketing. And no marketing means you're probably not selling any tickets. And that's a good scenario. There are some theaters in the city where the amount they charge for rental literally can't be made up even if you sell out every seat at a high price. The numbers literally don't add up. It's not possible to make your money back, let alone a profit, even if you sell out every show. Even if you have the max budget equity allows for a showcase code, and you sell out every ticket at $25 each in a theater at the max capacity equity will allow, the most you can make back is $21,900. That's $10,000 of your budget you're not going to make back 
no matter how well your show does. That means you're either paying for this out of pocket and can lose thousands of dollars, or you're trying to raise money telling people they will not even earn their money back let alone make a profit. Who's going to invest? And the sad part of this equation is that the movable expense lands squarely on your cast, creative team, and staff. It is possible to put a show up and pay creatives less than what they deserve. It's not possible to put up a show and not pay the rental fee. So guess what gets cut in the budget? Now, a lot of people respond to this with, if you can't afford to pay people what they're worth, then you shouldn't be putting up a show in the first place. But the sad truth is that even if that were the policy everyone adopted, almost nothing would get put up, ever. Because when the numbers don't add up to even make your money back in the first place with a bare bones production, how are you going to raise all the money you need to do the show right? If the amount of seats times ticket price won't allow you to earn back more than $21,900, what are theater makers supposed to do? Show business, is a business, and you have to at least be able to break even. Festivals and nonprofit theater companies are in an equally frustrating, albeit different, situation. They are not raising money for investors looking for monetary gain from the production. They're relying on people donating money, or sometimes working with producing partners, which goes back to the challenges I just mentioned, with the only benefit being that the donations are tax deductible. Raising money from people who know they're never going to get it back is certainly possible, but it doesn't make for the easiest business model or the highest budgets. Interestingly, the situation, while still difficult, isn't nearly as challenging outside of the United States. You can put up a show on the West End for a fraction of what it costs to put up a show even off or off-off Broadway in New York City, meaning you can raise the same amount of money, pay everyone much better, and be far more likely to turn a profit. So what's supposed to give? Like I said, Everyone needs to be earning a living wage. Company members should not take a hit simply because technically they are the easiest to trim in the budget. But if we commit to paying everyone what they're worth, it means the cost of space and other non-negotiables are going to have to decrease. Should ticket prices go up? Ticket prices are already extremely exclusionary. Should theater owners charge less rent? Maybe. But keep in mind, they're also dealing with property tax, electricity, and maintenance costs, etc. Should arts be subsidized by the government? My simple answer is yes. <laughs> we can see how well it works in the kinds of shows that are coming out of the UK. Most of those projects would never get developed in the US, partially because most producers can't afford to gamble on projects that might be a little experimental. My go-to is there is no way Matilda the Musical would have turned out like it did if it was created in the US, where risk-taking is financially dangerous. Almost every single new musical written by Broadway juggernaut Frank Wildhorn in the past 15 years has been developed and produced overseas, namely in the Czech Republic, South Korea, and Japan, with many never coming to the States at all. They don't need to. They were very successful, and costs in the U.S. were prohibitive. And keep in mind, these were first-class productions. And Wildhorn is just one example of this new paradigm. We need a path forward that is not simply villainizing any one group in this equation. Should Williamstown be paying team members a fair wage? Absolutely! If every theater company in America started doing that right now, would most of them go out of business within six months? Probably. Is it the theater company's fault? Yeah, sometimes, but not every time. The current economic system in the U.S., and New York City specifically, is unsustainable. If things keep going on the way they are, we are going to have less theater produced in the U.S., and the theater that is produced is going to get more and more minimal. And keep in mind, the numbers I've used for examples are for plays. Imagine adding musicians, larger casts, everything that comes along with a musical into the mix financially. That's why far fewer new musicals are being developed in the States than even 10 years ago. If we simply rely on the cry of, if you can't pay everyone what they're worth, don't put on shows, we're quite literally not going to have shows. Does that mean we shouldn't be paying artists what they're worth? Absolutely not. But what we need is not to uniformly create easy black and white villains in this situation. We need to systematically change the underlying problems before it becomes too late to course correct.